And so it does indeed seem that no matter where you look in the world, there was a period of very high culture thousands of years ago, and then after a period of time it began to be born again. Now the question comes, then, why should this be so? What happened to the earth that made all these ancient cultures disintegrate and then eventually be reborn? The first hint of an answer that I heard about came in seventh grade. My world history teacher talked about the Greek and Roman concept of the great year. Now, if you go to the Wikipedia website that talks about the great year, you won't learn too much. But if you go to their Ages of Man page, you'll learn quite a bit. For example, you'll learn that Hesiod seems to be the first Greek who talked about the Ages of Man. And according to him, the Golden Age was a period of peace and harmony. Humans did not have to work to feed themselves. They lived to a very old age, but with youthful appearance, and eventually died peacefully. Some several centuries later, Plato talks about Hesiod's concept of the Golden Age, and he feels obligated to clarify that Hesiod did not mean that men literally were made of gold, but were good and noble. You might say, oh, come on, Plato. Everybody can see that surely they're not talking about men of gold literally. But remember that Plato is talking to people in the Dark Age. And what do we know about people in the Dark Age? They have very limited ability for abstract thinking. For them, everything is taken literally. And so Plato found it necessary to explain, don't take this literally. This is just a figure of speech. Hesed himself found himself in the Dark Age. He called it the Iron Age. And during this time, he said that man knows of an existence of toil and misery. Children dishonor their parents. Brothers fight brothers. And the social contract between guest and host is forgotten. During this age, might makes right. And bad men use lies to be thought good. Some seven centuries after Hesiod, Ovid, the Roman poet, talked about a similar cycle of ages. Ovid emphasizes the justice and peace that define the Golden Age. In the Silver Age, humans learned agriculture and architecture. In the Bronze Age, men were prone to warfare, but not impiety. And finally, in the Iron Age, men demarcate the nations with boundaries, and they are warlike, greedy, and impious. Truth, modesty, and loyalty are nowhere to be found, says Ovid. So Ovid knew about the great year. The Greeks knew about the great year before him. How about the writers of the Bible? Did they know anything about the great year? Judge for yourself as we take a look at Daniel as he stands before King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret his dream. It's a dream interpretation with a twist, for King Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't tell Daniel the dream. It was a test. He said, Daniel, if your intuition is good enough to interpret my dream, it should be good enough to tell me what the dream was. So first tell me about the dream, and then tell me your interpretation. And here's what Daniel said. Picking up the story in chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 32, we first hear Daniel describing the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. He says, This image's head was a fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. And then skipping on down after having described a dream, he says, the interpretation, Thou art this head of gold, speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. In other words, there's going to come a kingdom of iron, an age of iron, we could say, and it's going to break all that has gone before. In other words, it's going to destroy the remnants of the higher age. That's the explanation that's given on the Ages of Man webpage that I mentioned earlier. For more in-depth interpretation, see Walter Crittenden's Lost Star of Myth and Time. It also has lots of other excellent information about the cycle of ages. 
The Ages of Man webpage also mentions that Sidiuk Teswar talks about the great year, and did he ever. Probably his little book, the second or the third book that I read after I got into SRF, and it gives a detailed description of the cycle of the ages and also the cause. Sidiuk Teswar bases his interpretation upon the writings of Manu, whom he describes as a great rishi, a lumen sage, and the Satya Yuga, in other words, of the Golden Age. And here's what he says. Uh, maybe we should use the English translation. Four thousands of years, they say, is the Krita Yuga, Satya Yuga, or Golden Age, of the world. Its morning twilight has just as many hundreds, and its period of evening dusk is of the same length. In other words, four hundred years for the morning twilight, plus four thousand years for the main body of the Satya Yuga, plus four hundred years for the evening dusk, equals forty-eight hundred years. And the other three ages, with their morning and evening twilights, the thousands and the hundreds decrease by one. In other words, 300 plus 3,000 plus 300 equals 3,600 years for the Treta Yuga, and so on down. In other words, 200 years plus 2,000 years plus 200 years makes 2,400 years. And then for the Dark Age, the Kali Yuga, it would be... 100 years, plus 1,000 years, plus 100 years, for a total of 1,200 years. And then, of course, the cycle starts again. He says that fourfold cycle comprising 12,000 years is called an age of the gods. For reasons that will become apparent momentarily, he also calls it an electric couple. One descending electric couple plus one ascending electric couple equals one electric cycle. Siddharth Teswar also gives beginning and ending dates for each of the yugas. For the last golden age, he says, the zenith occurred around 11,500 B.C. And since it's 4,800 years long, that means that the ending of the Satya Yuga, the golden era, was about 6,700 B.C. During this yuga, says Siddharth Teswar, Humans had the potential to reach their full intellectual capacity and comprehend all, including God the Spirit. In other words, their consciousness could expand sufficiently so that it could merge with the consciousness of God. Paramahansa Yoganandaji says that in this yuga, many people attain full realization. He also mentions that during this era, people had the potential to live to 400 years of age. After the Satya Yuga comes the Treta Yuga, beginning, of course, at 6700 B.C. and extending until about 3100 B.C. During this Yuga, humans have the capability of comprehending divine magnetism, the source of all electrical forces on which the creation depends for existence. After the Treta Yuga comes the Dwapara Yuga, with dates of about 3100 B.C. until 700 B.C., Human intellect in this yuga is half complete. Intellect can comprehend the fine matters or electricities and their attributes, which are the creating principles of the external world. And then finally, in the Dark Ages, the Kali Yuga dates 700 B.C. until about 500 A.D. The mental virtue is only one-fourth complete, unable to comprehend anything beyond gross material. He says that this yuga is characterized by widespread suffering, ignorance, and there's no peace in any kingdom. In contrast to the Satya Yuga, people in the Kali Yuga had the potential to reach only 100 years of age. According to the calculations of Sri Yukteswar, we completed the entire Kali Yuga cycle in about 1700 AD, and after the 200-year transition period, the ascending Dwapara Yuga began in about 1900 AD. And according to both these yogis and many others, we should be ascending into an era of improved peace and prosperity. But Yoganandaji warns us not to get too enthusiastic about the Second Age. He says the trouble with the Second Age is that there is not enough security, because science plays the part of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Man uses science not only to create and do good, but to destroy as well. Therefore, scientific development is not yet safe. 
the present world war. He was speaking in 1940, just before the U.S. entered into World War II. He says, the present world war shows how the technology of science is being used to destroy mankind. Elsewhere, he says that even in the highest age, in the Satya Yuga, even then there was not perfect peace. Saruk Teswar concludes that no one can overcome this influence except one who, blessed with pure love, becomes divine. Being baptized in a sacred stream, pranava, the holy alm vibration, that person comprehends the kingdom of God. So how does time affect humans? The answer is in the words of this song. If you know how to listen to the words with the ears of Sri Uteswar. We sang that song often when I was growing up in the Mount Washington Baptist Church. Now, why do these and other cultures have sacred rivers? Let's take another look at that quote from Sri Yukteswar. Baptized in the sacred stream of Pranava, the holy alm vibration. In order to understand Sri Yukteswar's reference to a stream, let's go back to something that we're familiar with. Let's take a look at that long descending passageway and the Great Pyramid that we talked about earlier. Let's say that we're going to the underground chamber below the base of that passageway. And we set up a tripod, put a camera on it. Let's say we zoom the zoom lens so that our field of vision is occupied primarily by the aperture that is formed by that passageway. And let's say we wait until nightfall and then what do we see? Well, not surprisingly, we see a star. Well, which star? Let's say that we walk up the passageway and take a look, and here's what we'd see. Well, not exactly. My daughter wouldn't be in the picture. My daughter's here because she obtained this photograph for me from a co-worker and friend, Kurt M. Lawson. Mr. Lawson set his tripod up, pointed it toward the North Star, opened up the shutter, left it open for one hour, and that's why it is that we see all these arcs of the stars. It's due to the Earth rotating, except for the pole star, of course. Now let's say we go back down that passageway and we watch that pole star for quite a while. Let's say we go out every night and take one photograph of the pole star, go out the next night, take another, and then make a movie of it. And what would we see? We would see that the pole star is moving. That's right, the pole star doesn't stay in the same place all the time. In fact is, the Earth has had several pole stars, and there have been long periods of time when there's no visible pole star whatsoever at the celestial North Pole. Now what is it that causes that movement? Sri Yukteswar says that we all know that the Earth spins on its axis. We all know that the Moon goes around the Earth. We all know that the Moon and the Earth both are traveling around the Sun. The Sun, the Earth, and all the other planets are moving through space. They're moving through space because, according to Sri Yukteswar, the Sun is part of a binary star system. According to NASA, over 80% of all stars are in binary or multiple star systems. So it wouldn't be too surprising to learn that our Sun is part of a binary star system. And that's why we have the movement of the North Star. If you could see the Earth from far out in space, and let's say that we could shoot a laser beam up to the celestial north pole through that descending passageway, we would see that over a period of about 26,000 years at the current rate, it traces a circle, almost a circle. It's slightly elliptical, actually. And it is this movement of the sun and the earth and all the other planets around the dual star that is responsible for what is known as this circle of precession.
Shall we bear with the river Where bright angels be drawn up And if the saints of the river But flow by the flood of God Yes, we can bear with the river Shall we bear with the river Where bright angels be drawn up And with the saints of the river That flow by the throne of God Yes, we can bear